Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's showtime, everyone. Tonight we have a banging debate lined up for y'all. Can Christians apost apostatize and still be saved? I'm absolutely thrilled for these two to engage in a lively discussion in just a few moments. But before we dive into the debate, I believe it's essential for our participants to introduce themselves briefly so our audience can get acquainted. We'll start with Sky out as he's been yeah, with yeah. us a few more times than Layman. And uh, as he's you know been with us a few more times, but Sky out, please take a moment to share with us about your channel, what you're up to, and anything else you'd like to plug. Well, thank you, Praise, and thank you, Layman Seminary. Um, I've been considering having open chats on my stream maybe once a week, twice a week. I'm trying to fit that in. And that's pretty much all I'm doing on my channel. I'm just trying to find more time to do more conversations and just open chats, open dialogue without any cursing or screaming. I just, just open chat, friendly dialogue. And that's what I've been up to lately. Awesome. Sky out. Thank you so much. I can't wait for you guys to uh, go out here in a few moments. We'll get, hand it off to Layman. So let him introduce himself, give a brief intro. Charles, go ahead. Yes, my name is Charles Jennings. My YouTube channel is The Layman Seminary. Uh, praise, it sounds like there's still uh, sound coming through yours. It's not loud, but it's still echoing through. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I thank Sky out for this opportunity. Uh, we're going to get into some things that I wish other people would challenge me on. And so I appreciate Sky out's willingness to challenge it so that we could develop things you know and we can have more sophisticated debates in the future uh so yeah my wife is janet she may be in the chat right now uh so uh shout out to her god bless guys guys all right thank you so much gentlemen for your intros and uh, check their channels out but before we get going here i'm going to get tonight's format as follows 20-minute openings, 10-minute rebuttals, 20-minute cross-exams, 5-minute closings, and Q&As. So make sure that uh, every, you, you tag me for questions so we can ask the debaters tonight. And since Charles is the affirmative, the positive, we'll start with him first, Charles. Um, and whenever you're ready, I'll share your screen and I'll start the timer, but also go on mute just in case you can, you guys can't hear me right. echoing through there. Give me a one-minute or two-minute warning, all right? Sounds good, Charles. Okay, so the topic for this debate is can Christians apostatize and still be saved? I'm taking the affirmative. The way that I would phrase that thesis is Christians can apostatize and are still eternally secure. What I mean by apostasy, at least for this debate, is this means that one can stop believing the gospel and or embrace another religion. In other words, after a moment of belief in the gospel, nothing done in the temporal realm can reverse what has already been done in the eternal realm. We are eternally preserved even if we do not temporally persevere. If one moment of faith is sufficient for eternal salvation, listen to this. If one moment of faith is sufficient for eternal salvation, perseverance is not necessary. And therefore, apostasy is possible. It's not a problem for Skyout's position. This is not the same as saying that necessary results will not follow. I would grant that all Christians bear fruit, but bearing fruit does not mean one will not apostatize. Uh, I will provide support for this argument, but the Bible gives illustrations that people often use for this. There's one look, which is at the bronze serpent compared to one moment of belief in John 3, 14. One drink that, that has eternal lasting results where the woman at the well never thirsts. And one bite, the food in John chapter 6. So with that said, I want to show y'all a screenshot of something Skyout said underneath one of my transparent debate preparation. For those that don't know, I do my debate preparation transparently so that people know pretty much exactly what I'm going to do in the debate. Skyout made this assertion, John 336, substantival participle, present tense, active verb. Well, first off, a participle is not a verb. It's a verbal. And he says that it means to continue in the faith. Okay? He says the present tense destroys all your arguments. Good luck, Charles. So my expectation is for Skyout 
to argue in this vein as it relates to apostasy, okay? He, he thinks that this is going to stand. I don't believe so. But before we get into the grammatical stuff, I want you all to uh, remember this from 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13. If we died with him, and we have because he's our substitute, in the ultimate category, we will also live with him. This is a promise that's guaranteed. Then we see if we endure, we will also reign with him. So this is a promise of future reward, of future service. But if we deny him, he will also deny us in our experience. This is a promise of loss of reward, of future service. And if we're faithless, he remains faithful to all his promises. His promises that uh, makes us eternally secure and his promises to hold us accountable. Now, this passage, 2 Timothy, also links to uh, Romans 6 and Romans 8. It's really interesting. The other day, uh, I can't remember who we were engaging with, but uh, somebody was challenging us on free grace, and I gave my responses from 2 Timothy, and praise went to the Romans passages. And I'm like, wow, great. I'm glad you did that. So you see 2 Timothy 2, 10 through 13, it talks about glory. It's highlighted. Romans 8, 11 through 25, you can see about the glory, the revealing of the sons, freedom of the glory, the children of God, our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Okay. Now, going into more detail, you can see 2 Timothy 10, 11. It is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with him. Watch what Romans 6 says. For he who has died is freed from sin. Talking about from the penalty of sin, positionally. Now, if we have died with Christ, watch this. We believe that we shall also live with him. And then, it, then it's going, knowing that Christ had been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So in other words, Jesus Christ died once. That's when we died because he was our substitute. And this is a guarantee that we're going to get resurrected. Now taking this over to Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I'm showing you these passages because what it's saying is if you died with Christ, and we have, then he's going to guarantee to give you a glorified body. Okay, that's what this is talking about. This is not talking about deny, uh, dying in your walk or whatever. There are other passages for that. But these particular emphasis right here is on this positional aspect of dying. All right. And then uh, 12 to 13, 2 Timothy. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, we will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Well, listen to how it's depicted in Romans 6. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin in your, in your walk, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments in unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Then we go to Romans 8. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put into death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with them, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, let me get a drink of water. There's some confusing passages that often people use concerning perseverance or maybe even apostasy. Okay, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 10, and I want you to think about this imagery, this bridegroom imagery where... Uh, Paul is the best man wanting to present the bride. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 3. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you're bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband 
so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of the devotion to Christ. Now listen to this. In particular, the statement about the betrothed idea present you as a pure virgin. Because watch what Colossians 1 says. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This is that pure virgin language. But look at this. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established, steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now, people that believe in perseverance of the saints, they'll take this passage to say that you must continue in the faith in order to get a glorified body. But that's not what this is talking about here. This is talking about being presented at the judgment seat of Christ. It's using this best man imagery and saying, look, you want to look good, on your wedding day when the bride, when, when the groom comes and gets you. That's essentially what's going on. So remember, now we're going to engage with what Skyout's claim is about the present tense. Number one, the participle is not a verb, even though he said it was a verb. It's a verbal, all right? I can explain the difference if I need to. He says it means continue in the faith. No, it doesn't. Now, I'm not a stranger to this subject. I've been studying this issue uh, about the Greek participle since about 2010. But in 2021, I wrote my advanced Greek one paper on the presence or absence of verbal aspect in the substantive participle. And I had done uh, other stuff prior to that. Uh, Matt Yester and I had a, a, a dialogue slash debate over Daniel Wallace's treatment of the participle that was instrumental in this. You can find this video. Uh, the, about the Greek substantive participle. As far as I know, when you search it in YouTube, I'm going to be the first one that comes up. But I want, what I want you to see, this is key to understanding this. You see this continuum? You have presence on one side and you have absence on the other. You have our verbio dependent on the verb. You have adjectival dependent on the noun. And then you have uh, independent substantival, means it's functioning as a noun. My claim for today is that when you see John 3.16, uh, 524, 3.18, 3.14, where it says believeth, as King James would say, that is a substantive participle, meaning it's functioning as the noun. In particular, it's functioning as the subject, okay? Now, I class this by red is presence and green is absence. And I could go into detail about why there's no verbal uh, force in the substantive participle. But before I do that, I want to let you know about this paper. This is a paper after I took my class, I also tutor seminary students and a particular person that was taking the same class that I took in 2021, took this last year. And based on what I taught him about the, the participle and we studied and researched it, I, I he took that and he applied it to John 316 in his own journey to, to verify and to examine my claims and other people's as well. And so he called his, does the substantive present participle and John 3.16 have aspectual force of continuousness? That's the claim of Sky Out. Well, this is how he started out his paper. After a careful reading of Daniel Wallace's Greek grammar beyond the basics, one would find that Wallace comments a significant amount of language to Pastuon, present active participle, and John 3.16 where he signs the aspectual force of habitual continual to the substantive participle. He says this about the present participle. The present was the tense of choice, most likely, because the New Testament writers, by and large, notice he says by and large, that doesn't mean everybody, saw continued belief as a necessary condition of salvation. Remember my claim in this debate. If one moment of faith is sufficient, then... Uh, Additional moments, continuing in the faith, anything like that, there's no other necessary conditions, okay? If Wallace is correct, this means that believers would have to continue to believe or endure throughout their lives in order to be saved. This interpretation of Pastoran is a good example how the grammar of word can influence one's theology, such as sociology. Now, I'm also going to be interacting with an argument 
that I recently read by Tom Stego in the current issues of sociology by the International Society of Biblical Hermeneutics. Does John's gospel require continual belief for eternal salvation? I compared this. I'm in free grace versus lordship class. I compared it to my prior work on the substantive participle, and it seems to be a solid case. Now, we're going into the details now. In John 3.16, the participle is substituting for a noun. This means it's functioning as the subject of the clause, of the sentence. The one believing is not focused on the action, but rather is a title. For example, Judas is called the betrayer even though he only betrayed Jesus once. John the Baptist is still called the Baptist, even though he's not continuously baptizing. You're called a sinner, even in John 5, 17, 19, because one sin makes you a sinner. In James 2, 10 and 11, you're called a trespasser. These are titles. You, If you break one law, you're a transgressor. One moment of belief in the gospel places one in the class of those who believed. If a person stops believing, one cannot say they never believed. We'll see this from John 3.18. It gives the basis of condemnation is that they have never believed. A believer is always positionally a believer, meaning that God recognized them at that one moment of a believe in the gospel where the transaction occurred, they received Christ's imputed righteousness and eternal life to their account. So, But the thing is, a positional believer can become an experiential unbeliever in their walk. Okay? But a positional believer can never become a positional never believer because he believed at one time. There are only two positions, options. The positional believer, we could say, is in Christ. The positional never believer is someone that has never been in Christ. Again, the basis of condemnation is that you never believe. John 3, 18, he who believes in them is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Look at the highlighted. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is the basis of condemnation. Having never believed, okay? John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. At the one moment of belief, you are free from positional judgment or condemnation. You have passed from positional death into positional life. We have addressed the participle functioning as nouns in John 3, 14 through 18 and 5, 24. Go into more detail. I know y'all have heard the arguments that the present tense means continuous habitual. You'll hear it all the time, whether you're talking to a Calvinist or an Arminian. My opponent will argue that this means that one will continue to believe because he assumes the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. So he assumes God would not allow a believer to apostatize in the temporal realm. But why don't he claim the preservation of the saints instead and argue that one is eternally preserved and cannot fall away from the eternal realm, even though they can fall away in the temporal realm? You know why? Because his confessional statements won't allow him to consider that. When you study the confessions, every time perseverance used, it's from a temporal passage. But guess what? The primitive Baptists believe that that's possible. And, 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 of course, free grace does too. The primitive Baptists claim to be sovereign grace. So why don't, why don't Sky Out just become sovereign grace? That's basically free grace, except you get to keep Tulip. And it's a better exegetical position because you don't go to a passage and say, oh, those people were never really saved. You see, one moment of belief is sufficient. So continual belief is not necessary. And even continued belief is not a necessary result unless you assume specific qualities of a gift faith, right? That's what Calvinism does. It's a God gives you the gift of faith and this quality of faith, it will cause you to persevere. But the thing is, is you have to assume Calvinism is true before arguing that way. But check out this. 
in Acts 16.30, when it says, uh, when the jailer's asking, what can I do to be saved? He, it doesn't say continue to believe to prove that you're saved. It, remember, one single moment compared to a look, compared to a drink, and compared to a, a bite of bread. The Calvinist does not tell you everything about the Greek. They'll make these arguments about the continual belief all the time. They always make these assertions. But guess what? They, they're, they're not giving you all the information. I got Old Testament passages if we need to do in, go into that. But I want to go deeper into the Greek. Since Sky Out claims that it destroys the free grace argument. All right. First thing you got to understand is when we're talking about the Greek present tense and the aorist tense, there's a famous article called The Abused Aorist Tense by Stagg. And it, he argues that a lot of times people want to make it a punctual action, a simple pass, and that's not always what's going on. And then the same thing, uh, Matheson wrote an article called The Abused Present Tense. It's in his intermediate gra uh, Greek grammar as well. This is the point. Greek forms do not inherently have objective kind of action, which is called action sart. Rather, it's a subjective portrayal of an action or a state by the author. In other words, aspect. So what we got to understand is we got to see how the same event can be described from two different camera angles. And I'll give you an example of that. Hold on. In Matthew 4.1, when it's talking about Jesus being taken up to be tempted, it uses the aorist infinitive. Aorist infinitive. It's, uh, did you say something, praise? praise? Yeah, one minute warning. Okay. In Matthew 4, 1, it uses the aorist infinitive to focus on the remoteness of the action, the helicopter view. But in Luke 4, the same description of the temptation is being described as with a present participle. To describe the proximate or up close action, like a reporter uh, on a parade or something. In Revelation 20, verse 4, the heiress is used as a remote summary to describe the whole thousand year period, wh where it talks about those that came to life and reigned. So the point is, is that these Greek tenses don't map to English tense words, okay? Well, that's why you got to run everything through the chart. When Jesus came, to be baptized, it's in the present tense, okay? The word crucify is normally in the aorist, but, but occasionally it's in the present tense. The present tense can certainly be used to portray a one-time event. It's used for the second coming of Christ in that way, his ascension, when the disciples go fishing, the incarnation as well. So what I'm arguing is that the present substantive participle in these passages is just a de generic description of a title. In other words, you enter into that title by one moment of belief, and therefore nothing else is necessary, and a Christian can still apostatize, and they're still saved. God bless. All right, Charles. That was a very stimulating opening there. Appreciate that. Now we're going to hand it off to Sky Up for his 20-minute opening. If you have a presentation, uh, Sky Up, just oh. share it and we'll put it on the board. I have no presentation. I was just going to talk. Okay, cool. <laughs> right on. So we're going to get started yes. underway here. Right, go and, ahead. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Um, my question today, ladies and gentlemen, um, to address is, Charles, can a true believer, a truly saved person, stop believing and revert back to being an unbeliever that's the real question so the question before us is whether a true justified believer may lose that justification and salvation you feel me so charles how can a person be a believer and not believe charles so how can a saved person be a Christ rejecting unbeliever, Charles. So how can a saved person be a Christ denying unbeliever? So if he is an unbeliever, then isn't he by definition unsaved in light of John 318, 336, and 824? So Charles, if the so-called believer, quotations, has become a Christ-rejecting unbeliever, then would not all of God's warnings to unbelievers 
apply to him. Charles, an unbelieving believer, is a contradiction in terms. Now, it is a false teaching to suggest that basically continuing in the faith is a requirement of going to heaven. All right. So a true believer does not continue in the faith in order to be saved. A true believer continues in the faith because he is saved. And thus, it is evidence and not a requirement. Paul presents this continuance in faith as an evidence of salvation in Colossians 1.23, but certainly not a requirement. Now, God not only saves a person by his grace, but he keeps a person by his grace. Now, Charles, free grace men argue that God keeps a person eternally secure in the eternal realm, but not secure in the temporal realm. Now, Charles, the Bible clearly teaches that the believer is kept by the power of God through faith. He is not kept apart from faith in the temporal realm, but God's keeping power is so great, Charles, that he not only keeps us safe in the internal realm, but he also keeps us faithful in the temporal realm. Ephesians 2.8, by grace, we are saved through faith. 1 Peter 1.5, by grace, we are kept, we are kept through faith. My thesis and argument tonight is that I am arguing that a weak faith or a false faith does not save. A faith that comes short of a true saving faith does not save. But an enduring faith in the power of God's grace does save. Now, by studying the writings of Ignatius, Polycarp, and Clement, as well as the Shepherd of Hermas, it is apparent that the development of apostasy means cut off of salvation. When we look at Hebrews 3.12, this is apostasy consisting of an unbelieving, self-willed movement away from God, in contrast to Hebrews 3.14, which must be prevented at all costs. Now, what is an apostate? An apostate is someone who's inside God's covenant community is part of the visible church whose professed faith in Christ seems to be a believer, probably partakes of the Lord's Supper and is a member of that congregation. And then later, he consciously, intentionally repudiates their belief in Christ and leaves the covenant community. The Christian apostate is pictured as a branch that does not abide in the vine of Christ and thus withers and is cast into the fire, John 15, 6. That is what an apostate is. Now, there is, however, at least one aspect of free grace teaching that is of great concern, ladies and gentlemen. This is their teaching that a true believer can totally depart From the faith, free grace teaches that it it is possible for a true believer to actually reject Jesus Christ as God's only Savior and totally reject the gospel of the grace of God. They say, free grace says, that a genuine believer can stop believing in Christ, can teach against Christianity, and can even blaspheme the Christ he once claimed to know. They admit the possibility of a real believer abandoning Christ totally and becoming a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Mormon, Jehovah Witness, or even a Satanist. Now, for clarification, people get confused. By that, I mean because they think this means that you can lose your salvation. 
The answer is no. Apostates are not people who were Christians and then stop being Christians. Apostates were never Christians to begin with, and only later did it become apparent that they weren't Christians. That does not mean people can actually lose their salvation, but God uses these warnings, uses the examples of apostates to encourage his people to stay true to the faith. This is something that we're always going to have to face in the church. Again, Charles, to reiterate, can a true believer, a truly saved person, stop believing and revert back to being an unbeliever? This is the question before us, whether a true, justified believer may lose that justification and salvation. Again, how can a person be a believer and not believe? How can a saved person, Charles, be a Christ-rejecting unbeliever? How can a saved person be a Christ-denying unbeliever? If he is an unbeliever, then isn't he by definition unsaved? Now, if the so-called believer has become a Christ-rejecting unbeliever, then all of God's warnings apply to him. A unbelieving believer is a contradiction in terms, Charles. Now, does the word believe always refer to saving faith, a faith that comes short of a true saving faith? Now, according to the scriptures, there are places where the word believe is used, but in the context, it indicates that it is describing a faith that comes short of a true saving faith. Now, this would be simpler if, if the word believe always refers to a saving faith, but it does not. Some of these examples I will mention in Luke 8.13 of the Stony Ground Hearers says that they believed for a while. This temporary faith is spurious and it comes short of a true saving faith. In 1 Corinthians 15.2, Paul speaks of a faith that is in vain. These false believers failed to hold fast the gospel which Paul preached. They believed in vain. Their faith fell short of a saving faith. The apostle is not implying that some of the Corinthian believers were lost for want of faith. Rather, it is their faith has never been sufficient for salvation. Now in John 2, 2, 3, there were many who believed in his name when they saw the miracles, which he did. Was this saving faith or did it come short of a saving faith? It was a faith based on miracles, which they saw. This faith was based on miracles. This comes short of a saving faith for a few reasons. Even though they believed in him, Jesus did not believe in them. He did not commit himself to them. He knew what was in them. He could see right past what that is called a shallow faith. One of these people who had faith based on miracles was Nicodemus. We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So this faith that he had was a faith in miracles and did not measure up to a saving faith. Now, next is John 8, 31. Jesus spoke to the Jews who believed on him. Is this describing a true saving faith? Now, there's indications in this context that Christ continues to the speak to the same group of Jews all the way to the point where he tells them that they are the children of the devil. How can true believers be children of the devil? It is clear that in verses 31 through 32, Christ is speaking to those Jews who believed in him, yet immediately the Lord seems to challenge their genuine, genuineness of their faith by telling them what is true, that genuine disciples are those who continue in his word. Now, in uh, James chapter 2, next is James chapter 2, James speaks of a 
dead faith, which is fruitless and barren and destitute of good works. And he also speaks of demons who believe and tremble. Next is Simon in Acts 8.13. Simon believed and was baptized. Now, was this a saving faith? The words of Peter seem extremely harsh and strong for anyone but a wicked unbeliever. Verses 20 through 23. Thy money perish with thee. This implies that Simon was going to perish. The literal translation. Thy silver be with thee into perdition. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Peter was just talking about the God's gift of salvation. And if Simon had no part in that, he must have been unsaved since Simon was a sorcerer. Now, my main point, my main argument, if a person does not hold fast to the gospel message, then according to Paul, he is not saved. He has believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2. Now, we are kept. This is my position. We are kept by the power of God. But God keeps us through faith. 1 Peter 1, 5. Not apart from faith. He not only keeps us saved, but he keeps us believing in Christ as our Savior. So our faith might be weak at times, but it does not utterly fail. The person that does not hold fast in the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, Hebrews 3, 6 and 14, proves that he is not part of Christ's true house. He was just a temporary attachment, a mere scaffolding. We can tell that the scaffolding is not part of the true building house because after a time, it falls and withers away and does not continue with the building. First John 2.19 and Luke 8.13. Now Christ interceded for Peter that thy faith fail not. And does not the Lord intercede for all believers in the same way? In the same way. So does his prayer go unanswered in some cases? Is Jesus only the author and finish of our, our faith? Or he, is he just the author of our faith? Now, um, again, my main point is that in Romans 8, 28, 39 tells us that no one can bring a charge of God's elect. Nothing can separate the elect from the love of Christ. God makes everything work together for the good of the elect and all whom God saves will be glorified. God loves his children, the elect, so much that nothing can separate them from him. Now, of course, this same truth is seen in many other passages of scripture as well. In John 10, 27 through 30, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am and the Father are one. Again, John 6, 37 through 47, we see Jesus stating that everyone who the Father gives to the Son will come to him and he will raise all of them up on the last day. <clears throat> now, back to apostasy, because there are passages where the Greek verb scandalizio means fall away from the faith. And we use the noun scandalion, which means enticement to unbelief, cut off of salvation, seduction of apostasy. There's also a Greek word called pipto, fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and Hebrews 4, 11 use this language. And ek pipto, fall off or from. Galatians 5, 4, 2 Peter 3, 17. These are all used in the New Testament to refer to the consequent loss of salvation to apostates. Now, what is the Greek for apost uh, apostate? It is apostasia. It means rebellion, abandonment, state of apostasy, defection. We only see this twice in the New Testament in Acts 21, 21 and 2 Thess Thessalonians 2, 3. Now, when we understand the scriptures of what I just explained, when we use... Um, 
the term scandalazio, it means to fall away from the faith. When we look at the interpretation of the parable of the sower, Mark 4, 13 through 20, with you parallel that with Matthew 13, 18 through 23, those identified with the seeds sown on rocky ground, those with no root in themselves. These are the inconsistent ones that go astray to their own ruin when persecuted on the account of the word. They fall away from the faith. Mark 4.17, parallel with Matthew 13.21. When we look at the Lucian parallel, reads appropriately a feastimate, means to fall away. In Matthew 24.10, Jesus even talks about the end times. Many will fall away, scandalazio. The result is that they will hate one another, wickedness will be multiplied, and love will go cold. Yet Christ says, yet whoever endures in love until the end will be saved. Now, when we're talking about the Johannian fail, farewell address in John 16, 1, again, the Greek word is skandalazio. It doesn't imply endangering a faith, but falling away from the faith entirely, from which the disciples and Christians are to be kept. We're in, in the active voice, scandalazio means cause someone to fall away from or reject the faith as in the saying of jesus about the person who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin or stumble mark 9 42 parallel with matthew 18 6 with the lucian parallel with luke 17 2 the christian is enjoined to reject anything that might be an obstacle to faith, as emphasized in Mark 9, 43, 45, and 47. In metaphorical, hyperbolic language, hand, foot, eye, Jewish understanding of lust and sinful desires must be given up only if they threaten to become the cause of loss of faith and thus of salvation. Now, this is the seriousness of conviction one minute thank thank you praise this is the seriousness of conviction within which one must persevere if one wishes to enter eternal life or the kingdom of god matthew 5 29 and 30 issues these sort of exhortations to stay in the faith now first corinthians 8 9 a Christian's freedom regarding eat food offered to idols reaches its limit when it becomes a stumbling block to one's brother, proskonomini. Paul emphasized he will never do that again, eat meat, if by doing so he causes his brother to fall and thus lose salvation, scandalazio. And I yield my time. All right, Scott, appreciate that uh, comprehensive opening there. And it was um, now we're going to transition into our next period in this debate. It'll be the rebuttal for 10 minutes. And then Charles will be on ready to go here. When are you ready, Charles? I'll start your timer. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I want to remind y'all what Sky Out claimed. That the present tense destroys all my arguments, yet he never once brought up that I could recall any arguments for the Greek and all of that. So he, he knew what was coming and he didn't speak on it. Maybe he's going to try to clean it up in the rebuttal. Furthermore, I want you all to know this. I found the exact paragraphing, phrasing, think of scaffolding, which is erected around a building during times of construction and repair. Scaffolding is merely a temporary attachment, okay? It's possible Sky Out is quoting from this resource, but I would venture to say that it's probably in here. The reason I bring this up, because in his debate with Jack Smack, 
word for word, he copied his opening. Is it possible he done this? Should he cite his sources in light of the fact that he didn't show integrity in that first time? I'm therefore skeptic that this opening is even his. But regardless of whoever wrote it, I will resp reply to it. He asked the question, can a true believer stop believing? And he says, lose justification. Now, look what he's saying here. Number one, I don't believe you can lose positional justification. See, he thinks that we're saying that you can lose positional justification. Because he's assuming that belief is what saves you. It's not what saves you. Belief is the instrument that places you into a new realm that makes the transaction occur where the card is swiped and now everything is infinitely in your account. You're immune. You have all of God's uh, Christ's righteousness in your account. Okay. He made the assertion about John 3, 18, but never went into the Greek. He talks about the warnings, that if it's an unbeliever, the warnings apply to the unbeliever. I think that most of the warnings in the Bible refer to believers. But, but Skyout doesn't want to grant that because it has implications not only for his doctrine, but also for his lifestyle. He claims that I have a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction because a true contradiction is where you have A and non-A, and, and, and but if it's in if it's in a different sense or in a different time, it's not a true contradiction. He says that that, that evidence of continuing the faith is not the same thing as a requirement. I never said it was. He brought up Colossians one twenty three, which I brought up in my opening statement and showed an alternative example. Yet he didn't modify his opening to even slightly counter that. Maybe he'll get it in the uh, rebuttal. Another thing he does is he assumes the word keep. He assumes that the word keep is referring to uh, eternal security or kept in the sense of uh, in your walk. But the question you have to ask is this. Yeah, he could keep. Uh, I believe he keeps us eternally secure. Why don't I believe that one can keep them te uh, temporally secure? Well, God can keep us temporally secure. But the thing is this, why do we sin? Is God not keeping us from sin? This means God has chosen to keep us from certain things and not keep us from other things. Furthermore, when you go to 1 Peter, when you look at that passage, that's actually talking about experiential faith. We're kept, preserved, and protected in our walk by faith. Salvation of the soul is not talking about how to get saved, just as Skyout said. It's not a requirement. So the salvation of the soul is not talking about salvation. And then he used the word keeps us faithful. But yet he means a special definition of faithfulness. He means not stop believing in Christianity. He's not talking about living a debauchery lifestyle because he himself has engaged in that lifestyle. I'm glad he's coming out of that, that we know of. He mentions about weak or false faith. I think there's a difference between weak and false. Weak means it's existent, but it's it, it's there. And false would mean it's not there. He mentions about coming short. Okay, we all come short of that. Then he made an allusion to church history and wants to try to make an argument that uh, that how they understood apostasy is correct. Well, there's a lot of false things uh, in, in church history. Why don't you become Greek Orthodox or... Or Catholic. As for all the other things you pretty much did, was you brought about mere assertion. You said Hebrews 3, 12 and 14. I have an alternative explanation of those passages. It's a warning to believers, and it's a danger of loss of reward and divine discipline and chastisement. You talked about the term apostate related to covenants. I don't believe covenants are sociological categories. You mentioned John 15, 6 about the apostate. Well, let's just assume Judas is an apostate, all right, in the sense of never believed, according to your definition. That don't affect John 15, 6 for me. That would just be saying that it's talking about Judas. There's also other interpretations of, of John 15 that we could deal with, but none of them affect free grace. You, you brought up about this whole idea about uh, uh, continuing in the faith or departing from the faith. Well, that could refer to the doctrines of Christianity. And you believe that one could depart from certain, some doctrines. You wouldn't say that I'm, a, I'm not a believer because I hold to free grace, would you? Maybe you would. I don't know. 
And then far as about the apostasy thing, remember within free grace, there's a hypothetical view and an actual view. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that he's assuming that justification is on the basis of a special gift faith that has a continuing quality. He brought up about de demonic faith, weak faith. I mean, demonic faith, temporary faith. You know, he brought up passages about vain and all of that. What, number one, he's not understanding James 2 correctly. The, you know, that's dealing with the usefulness. He's not understanding 1 Corinthians correctly when the word vain is there. It's either vain because you didn't believe the right content or it's vain in the sense of not being useful. Either one of those are free grace alternatives. Then he wants to go and try to say that there's times in the Bible where faith is not sufficient for salvation. And he gives the example of people that believed in miracles in John 2. And he says, oh, they really didn't get saved because they just believed in miracles. But that approach goes against the purpose for the Gospel of John. There were many signs in the Gospel of John that were written so that you may believe. So God wants you to believe based on the signs and miracles that point to it. And then he's saying that he saw what was in them. Yeah, they believed the gospel, but they weren't prepared for discipleship. So he didn't entrust himself to, to develop them as disciples in his life. And then you want to talk about that that the, uh, that Israel didn't believe in John 8. They did believe, but then he started talking to an inner circle, a subset, challenging in them. Okay, that's when he talks about the, if you're a disciple indeed, the truth will set you free. So. Again, he talks about the harsh language from the book of Acts about Simon the Sorcerer and all that. Yes, it's harsh language. They were apostles. They could tell them to drop dead. It doesn't mean they're not saved. And you're assuming that a sorcerer can't be saved. Yet in Ephesus, they didn't burn their books, magical books, for like five years. So he's making all these assumptions about these issues. Okay. And so the other thing is he makes an assertion about the house, talking about uh, in, in Hebrews. Well, the house is not referring to salvation. It's referring to being a part of the priesthood, uh, reigning and ruling now so that we rule and reign later on, serving in that capacity. Not a problem there. Then he goes into some passages in Matthew talking about the kingdom, about entering the kingdom. Well, the kingdom's not salvation in those passages. As far as everything he said about scandalizo, pipto, parapipto, apostasy, all of those terms like that, it doesn't affect any of my arguments. In fact, my, my free grace view of everything is like an amoeba, and it can swallow up everything he throws at me. Free grace has greater explanatory power, and that's why I'm going to continue with this uh, and show you exactly what I'm talking about until my time runs out. He didn't deal with those Greek, though, right? Let's see this claim about destroying free grace. I already talked about, now here are eight examples where the present participle is not always used for continuous. And these are not sociological passages, and they don't involve the word pastuo. So you One can't minute. Say, you can't say we're reading them wrong. It's used for the betrayer. It's used for when it says that Jesus would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, talking about his death. It's used for the one dip uh, of Judas into the sop. It's used for the new covenant blood that's poured out for many. It's used for the child to be born that will be called, talking about Jesus. And it's used when it says everyone who divorces his wife and marries another. It doesn't mean continually divorce or continually marries. Uh, it's also used for Jesus being called the one who's coming into the world. So the present tense does not always mean continuous habitual, number one. Number two, in addition to that, the heiress does not always refer to the past tense. And there's more that we could talk about concerning the purpose statement for the Gospel of John and all of that. And we have uh, variations and classifications for all that. But I'll yield my time there. God bless. Excellent, Charles. Thank you so much for that rebuttal. And now we'll hand it off to Sky out for his 10 minute rebuttal. Whenever you're ready, Sky out, just let me know. And I'll, All be, right, on board. I'll be ready now. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, the reason why I didn't bring up the Greek with Charles in my last opening was because I do not grant his presupposition, especially on John 
three three six. I just don't believe his presupposition. He also did not address my Greek words, uh, scandalazio, to cause to fall away, a feast to go away, withdraw, depart, fall away. Now I don't want the audience to be confused, but I'm not saying a true believer can fall away. I'm saying that an apostate never believed in the first place and he is not saved. And these these um Greek this Greek here, scandalazio, pipto, fall, and ekpipto only apply to apostasy. So just like in other verses of scripture, especially in Romans 16, 17, the word Greek word here is scandalion. It means enticement to unbelief to cut off salvation loss to the apostate. Um, there are various satanic activities of the false teachers who endanger this salvation, Romans 16, 17. Now, again, Peter addresses the situation of apostasy similar to uh, immorality, 2 Peter 2, 2, 3, 14, 16. These are false teachers who have denied the master who bought them, 2 Peter 2, 1. Now, let's talk about the Old Testament for a moment. Now, when we talk about Israel's apostasy, they use a lot of references such as a rebellious ox, maybe um, a, a wild vine or a prostitute, a stain that will not wash off, a camel in heat and a thief caught in thievery, Jeremiah 2, 19 through 28. Now, these images of apostasy have forsaken God and they have come under his judgment, Exodus 22, 20. Now, the New Testament also talks about apostasy, including a plant taking no root among the rocks, but withering under the hot sun of testing, Mark 4, 5 through 6. Now, uh, these have to do with false teachers that once professed in Christ, but now have fallen away and became heretical beliefs, 1 Timothy 4, 1. They have went back to the worldliness and its defilement, 2 Peter 2.20, and their own persecution. Now again, the Christian apostate is a branch that does not abide in the vine of Christ. You must be in the vine of Christ. If not, you wither and cast into the fire, John 15.6. This is similar to the animal behavior invoked in a dog returning to its vomit or a clean pig returning to the mire, 2 Peter 2.2. And uh, the related verb, verb apistemate means to go away, withdraw, and to fall away. There's many passages in scripture that speak of apostates that departed and fell away. Now, um, there's, there's more as far as the related verb uh, apistemate, draw, and this is the reason why the New Testament brings us so many good passages of exhortations and to tell us what is the true vine in Christ. Now, I'm going to uh, show a picture of Charles' position. He believes in the apostate believer view, a truly saved person foolishly returns to the world and loses his reward. If we assume that the worldly, carnal, backslidden apostate believer is saved and will spend eternity with Christ in heaven, based on this assumption, how could we ever say that the latter state is worse than the beginning state? How could being worldly, saved person be worse than being a worldly, unsaved person? How could having hell as one's destiny be better than having heaven as one's destiny? How could eternal death be better than eternal life? How could the lake of fire be better than the bliss of paradise? How can damnation be better than salvation? So if we study this chart here, the beginning state is that the person is lost in the world and of the world, 
The middle state is that a person is saved in the world, but no longer in the world. And then the latter state, this person gives up, he gets out of fellowship, and he turns from God and his commandments and returns to the world. By definition, he is not saved. So uh, that's my position, and I yield my time. All right, Scott, appreciate that rebuttal. And now we'll head into our next period in the debate, which will be the cross-examination period, 20 minutes. And since Skyout ended, Charles could lead the cross-examination period. Go ahead, Charles. Let's get us started. Yes, yeah, Skyout, did you uh, uh, plagiarize any, any of your opening this time? No, I did not. Okay. Is it is it correct that you used the site of MiddletownBibleChurch.org dot no. uh, in your opening? No. So, are these words exact wording that you said? Think of scaffolding, which is erected around a building during times of construction or repair. Scaffolding is merely a temporary attachment; it's not a real and genuine part of the building. Proof of this is the fact that the scaffolding does not continue with the building, but rather it takes down and remove. If a person is truly part of Christ's house, then that will be person do according to Hebrews uh, three six. Are you are you saying under oath in front of your Christian friends that that you did not plagiarize that statement there? No, I can actually tell you right now what exactly what I read. Um, when I quoted Hebrews 3, 6, I said that he's not part of the true house. He's a temporary attachment, a mere scout. Okay, building. all right. Let the record show. Y'all can go back and play the video. I'll, and when I do an after show or when praise, I have a machine that gives the exact transcript. Now, the, okay. you you said you did not grant my argument. You provided no counter. You, 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 you can't do that. You need to uh, put an argument against that. So what is your argument against John 3.18 to refer to the fact that it's saying that one moment of belief is all that it takes for a person to pass from death to life, like 5.24 says? Well, I actually agree that one moment in time of faith is, I actually agree with you, you only have to believe in one time. But I, I, I personally believe that one time must be a genuine, true saving faith in yeah. that one time so. right I, I understand how you view that now the thing is is that you claimed that i made a contradiction because i said mm -hmm. a believer can become an unbeliever are you aware of the law of non-contradiction sure yeah okay so if i say that there's such thing as a positional believer that can fall into unbelief in their walk is that a contradiction yes to me it is on what basis? I would say it's a contradiction based on the internal evidence of faith that God provides to the Christian. That it, so, the Bible keeps us through faith in 1 Peter 1, five. Okay, so you're using 1 Peter as a way to try to claim that I'm making a contradiction. So it's not a contradiction for me to make that claim. It's a contradiction with your theology. That's what you're saying, right? No, I'm saying that I'm not granting the hypothetical free grace doctrine that an I don't ask I don't want you to grant me anything. I want you to counter what I have. Okay, so you brought up first Peter. I made a counter assertion that first Peter is talking about faith that we have in our walk, that we're kept protected by God during our walk through faith. But if we're not walking in faith, we're not protected. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I, I agree that God protects us in the internal realm and the temporal realm. Okay, so what? why do you think that that passage is saying that we're kept in the sense that we're going to have to persevere to the end? I, well, you just you just agreed that, that, uh, that the doctrine that I believe in is correct, you know, in that sense. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that. Well, um, this verse, to me, it's pretty clear it says by grace we are kept through faith first peter 1 5 it this is not talking about in a sense of salvation it's talking about right. in a sen sense of um true and genuine faith versus a weak faith that does not are save. you are 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 you uh 
familiar with uh, the NASB 1-5, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All the okay. passage is saying is that one is protected or kept by the power of God. It doesn't say that you're kept so that you will get a glorified body. That's not what the focus is on. It already told you in the previous verse. Uh, it, it says right here in verse three, it mentions he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from dead. That's positional. And then he talks about we have an inheritance in parish that is reserved in heaven for you. So there's no issue of doubt there. Do you agree with that? that Actually, that do, we're going to get a glorified body. Well, I do, but I think this is specifically talking about the genuine Christians. It's not speaking to apostates. All right. Well, but I agree that it's genuine Christian. The thing is that you're making an assumption of what a genuine Christian can do and can't do. And, and that you're bringing that from other passages. You know, you use this passage to, to interpret 318, and now we're going to have to jump to another passage. So what passage is driving your interpretation that's saying that genuine faith would not allow for my interpretation of 1 Peter 1.5? Um, I would say, by definition, to counter your argument, I would say John using John 3.18, I would say John 3.18 is applying to unsaved, and then John 3.36 and 8.24 is also being applied to the unsaved apostate. That would be my, my counter. Because we're, we're, if you if we I, I use God's warnings to unbelievers that apply to the apostate, I'm I really don't care if you but that's an assumption that's an assumption. You assume that all warnings refer to unbelievers because you believe that they're a means to motivate the elect. Now here's my here's my question to you. Are you aware that in 2 Peter chapter 2 that when it's talking about the 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 latter state is worse than the beginning that the mm. beginning is talking about is not salvation, it's talking about the beginning of sanctification? Um I I, w I wouldn't I wouldn't grant that. I don't think it's talking about the beginning of sanctification. It's Did you see my debate with Crimson Air on that passage? I didn't. Okay. All right, for it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. All right, so the, the last state has become worse for them than the first. The, so in the Bible, in Galatians 3, it says, this I want to know from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by faith? If by faith, are you trying to make yourself perfect in the flesh? In other words, Paul would tell times whenever people are uh, walking good in their sanctification. They were running well, as another passage says. You know, uh, uh, do, do you think it's po that's a possible interpretation that it's really describing how a Christian, whenever they first get saved, it's like a honeymoon, they're serving the Lord, they haven't encountered false teaching, they haven't struggled with sin. After that, you know, they're, they're, they're on a high kind of, you know, don't you think that that's a possibility? That this is talking about the freedom that you have after being saved and then you've fallen into false teaching later on? Yeah, sure. I mean, I can grant that, but I, I believe this freedom and that is in faith that later on, that if this person somehow departed from that faith, it wouldn't be a true saving faith to begin with. So this this wouldn't uh, apply to so a, what uh, other so what passages are making you think that? Oh, what passages are making you think that you can depart from the faith and this means that you were never really saved? Oh, you brought up. Passages. Well, uh, give me one. Let's go. Let's go down the list. <laughs> well, there's, there's many. You passages. claim you claim I never dealt with Scandalizo, Parapipto and all of that. Uh -huh. But I said it. I have an amoeba that swallows up all your arguments. My view accounts for all that. It's just saying that Scandalizo, the stumbling block or falling away is in the temporal realm. It's your assumption that those passages are talking about the eternal realm or that God's promising to preserve one temporally, and, and that's not in the text. So I want to know where you're getting that from. What are the primary passages, your crux interpreting passages that are driving your, uh, your view of these other passages? Well, I'm using the term believe 
always refer does it always refer to a saving faith so there's passages such as that's not the claim because unbelievers uh, unbeliever when an unbeliever believes the gospel yeah it's saving faith in that sense but believers can believe you agree with that right but can believers believe sure okay so making a claim that belief doesn't always refer to the saving sense i understand that but that's not what's really going on you're trying to say that these passages are talking about a false spurious temporary temporal temporal faith are, are you aware of the origin of that the idea that satan can make you think that you're saved but but that effervescent faith doesn't last um i understand what you're saying the temporal realm the eternal realm but i believe that the bible clearly teaches that a believer is kept by the power of god through faith even you in the you've made realm. that a, you made that assertion but how do you know that you don't have temporary faith because of continuing continuous faith and progress you're continuing faith. right now but you have not per persevered to the end of your life so how do you know that you're one of the elect god's grace how do you know god's grace has been given to you because i believe <laughs> how do you know that you're actually believing if you're going to go with a genuine belief how do you not know that you didn't receive a temporary spurious faith and satan's just making you think you're saved um, I would say um, if that's the case, then I, I wouldn't be reading my Bible or praying or repenting or falling. That's not what that's not what other Reformed people say. Reformed okay. people, I mean, even Calvin, I think, if I remember right, when I read talking about temporary faith and stuff, it talks about the fruitfulness and the, and the results of things like that. The issue is, is not what you're doing now. It's what you it, it, whether you continue, whether you persevere. I mean, that's your doctrine. That's not mine. It's good to persevere, but I don't believe that my salvation is proven by that. My maturity, my faithfulness is proven by that. Well, I I mean, there's some parts I would disagree. I don't believe a saved person can be a Christ rejecting unbeliever or a Christ. Why do you why do unbeliever. you not believe that? If if a, if a Christian can fall into a little bit of doctrine, why can't he <laughs> fall into a little bit of false doctrine? <laughs> because unbelieving believer is a contradiction in terms it's a no false it's not thing. in one sense you believed at one moment in time and that's when the transaction occurred and then you became an unbeliever after that moment of salvation second peter as well as galatians 3 shows you that paul and peter both talk about a time after salvation where it's describing your initial moments of sanctification so why can't that happen in the same sense that one can become an unbeliever in their walk? Because I, I believe that faith and sanctification and justification is an ongoing pro well, ongoing process of sanctification. Are you saying you believe justification <laughs> is a process? Yeah, let me finish, man. Come on. Um, I believe that sanctification is an ongoing growing process of, of growing in the spirit and reading your Bible and understanding that God gives you his grace and grants you his power to not fall. John so, 16, 1. So what if you don't confess your sins? What if you don't get in fellowship <laughs> with God? What if you don't read your word? Then you're What's not going to happen. Then you're not a Christian. Oh, so really when you sin, it's not you that did it. It's because God didn't keep you enough. Right. So every time you sin, Skyo, whose fault is it? Is it your fault or mine. is it God's fault? Why would it be God's fault? It's mine. God's given you the power to resist and he can keep you from it. He chose you to keep you from persevering, but yet he don't keep you from sinning. Yet he kept uh, Abimelech from sleeping with Abraham's uh, wife. Why can't right. God? Why, why don't God keep you from sinning? Well, I think God does keep you in control by his blessings and by his grace so you don't fall away to apostasy i mean everyone sins but they don't so god so god right, the, per, the, per, the perfect god that's supposedly per persevering in you that gave you this gift evidently is not perfectly persevering because that would lead to sinless perfectionism it sounds okay. like your system has a contradiction because if God is giving you a gift and he's perfect, a perfect God given a perfect gift, don't you think that will result in perfect results if you're pleading the way that you are? I believe that he cannot fail. And I believe that a person that holds I, fast to the gospel message. Yeah, but you can fall. fail. You can fail. You said when you sin, it is your fault. 
All right. So you can fail. So even though God cannot <laughs> fail, God, you can grieve or quench the spirit. And if you could grieve or quench the spirit a little bit, then you could grieve and quench them a lot, which means that you could choose to not uh, uh, serve him. Now, would you let me ask you this question? Do you well, limit apostasy only to stop believing Christianity? Is that your definition or do you recognize other forms of apostasy? Well, there's 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 apostasy by definition is someone who partakes in the Lord's Supper of that congregation and later consciously repudiates their belief in Christ. I believe a Christian apostate is a branch that doesn't abide in Christ. It's a vine that withers away. Okay. And cast into the fire. Right. John those, those are, we, we got those assertions. You mentioned first Corinthians <laughs> 11. Do you believe that the people that were weak, sick and sleep were believers? Most likely, that, yeah. But, but, yeah. Yeah, I believe okay. they're a believer. So, yeah, go so God in that situation killed somebody for a uh, concern of the Lord's Supper. So why wouldn't God kill anybody uh, that is a believer so that they won't apostatize? You think that's a possibility? I I don't. I think God allows apostasy to happen to show what true believers are and to show an examples of exhortations in the book of Hebrews. Would you consider those people that not ate of the Lord's Supper in that particular way a form of apostasy? Yes. Okay, so you just said that they were believers that apostatized. I did because they didn't have a true saving faith. They were a weak. No, oh, so you're saying they weren't really saved. You're saying they weren't really saved. Yes, I'm saying that. Uh, that is not what you said a second ago. That is not what you talk, said a second man. ago. Okay, go ahead. All right. Yeah, let me talk, man. I'm saying that there's many places in scripture where the word believe doesn't always mean a true saving faith in Christ. There's many verses that talk about that. Um, Give me one. Give me one so we can talk about it. I'm tired of the assertions. I want to dig okay. in. Okay. In, in John 8, 31, Jesus spoke to the Jews who believed on him. And then later on, he says they're the children of the devil. So why, can't a, why can't a believer be a child of the devil? Assuming that, that, <laughs> that that's not referring to the subset. What, oh, you can't, you can't no. act. You can't act like the devil. Can a believer act like the devil? I <laughs> can no, a believer have so. hate. Can a believer have hate in their heart? No, I don't think so. You don't believe believers can hate. N not not like the apostate or unbeliever, the satanist. No. I'm talking about do believer can believers hate? Yes or no? No, I don't. So you don't believe believers ever hate? I don't believe a true saving faith in Christians hate. Do you anything. ever hate? No. So you're not a hater? I'm not a hater. <laughs> you're telling me you've never hated on anyone in your entire life? Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying that. I think when I became born again, I wanted to serve Christ and become more like him. So I stopped, you know, the hater ability, I guess. So you think that if a person is a hater, they are not born again, right? I know. I, I didn't say that. I, I mean, I know you're trying to go that direction. I'm just saying for myself, for other Christians, they might have hate in their heart or maybe no love for God in their heart, but it doesn't contradict that they're not saved. I think that um, in this sense that if they're lacking in fruit of sanctification, I think it, it just shows that they have a weak faith. But remember two my assertion. Two minutes. Remember my assertion. Just because I grant that all Christians bear fruit doesn't mean that all Christians uh, won't apostatize. That's kind of interesting because if a Christian bears fruit, to me, that is evidence that they're saved he, and they cannot apostatize. Well, fruit is the evidence of maturity. It's not. It's not evidence of salvation because fruit looks good to well, us. It's an evidence of faith, not. How not do you know? How do you know that when you see fruit? That it's done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Easy. When I see fruits done in the power of the Holy Spirit by a believer preaching. Can the you see the Holy Spirit? Can I see the Holy Spirit? No. Do you know when you're in fellowship with God? Sure. How do you know when you're in fellowship with God? When the, the Spirit convicts you through the scriptures when you're when you're in a crowd. What if you're not reading the scriptures? Uh, if you're not reading the scriptures and you're just you know, going off memory, I think we can still open the gates of heaven here and have the spirit. Okay. What if you're not meditating on God at all? 
then you're you're not a believer. You're not a believer if you don't meditate on God. Yeah, you're. You, it, it's so when a person man. when a person is looking at pornography, are, are, are <laughs> they meditating on God? <laughs> no. So are they a believer? Probably. I, I don't know why you're bringing up sins. Because when you're sinning, you can't be meditating on God. Yeah. I, how does that cancel? But out you yourself? just said uh, you just said if you're not meditating on God, you're not saved. Yeah, but for that particular person, but if I'm talking about a Christian, a person, a Christian can backslide, but it doesn't mean they reject Christ in their future. I, I understand that, but you keep trying to get proofs of salvation. And of every time you bring a proof of salvation, I challenge you on it and you give ground. So you well, don't uh, have a, a definitive proof of salvation. You just have a mere assertion. A Calvinistic well, no. system being asserted. We'll probably wrap it up here, gentlemen, for the oh. first cross exam. <laughs> and now I appreciate that lively cross exam. Well, now it's your turn, Sky. I'll see you bring it to Charles now. Go ahead. We'll start your 20 minute timer. <laughs> good, good job, Charles. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Let's let's continue to my cross examination. Um, Charles, um, a saved person in scripture is off, often referred to as a believer in Acts 5.14. Now, again, how can a person be a believer and not believe? Well, because they believed at one moment in time, and therefore that classifies them to be in the class of the believing ones. Okay. If he is a believer and he now does not believe, does that mean by definition that he is not saved in light of John 3.36 and 8.24? No, it does not. Okay. So how can a personally... A person totally reject the truth of God and the gospel of grace, and you still call you still call him a saved believer because he believed in one time. Yes, because they accepted the gospel one moment, and there was a forensic as well as an ontological transformation and transfer that occurred at that moment. Okay, I agree that there. I agree that there's a professors of the faith. There's also who are not possessors of the of the faith. How how do you distinguish the two with certainty? I don't. I believe there's such thing as infil infiltrators. These are people that, that, you know, they want to hook up with a girl. They never believe the gospel because they never really believe it's true. Uh, they want to hook up with a girl. They, they're for business contracts or something like that, but they, they don't believe the gospel. Right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, of course, there's a lot of scriptures that I would probably bring up with that, but that's okay. Now, does the word believe always refer to a saving faith? No, it can refer to experiential faith. Okay, so does experiential faith mean that it is a true saving faith? It means that Christians express faith in their walk. All right. So, um, but again, there's many passages of scripture, especially for the, the Greek. Um, what do you think about in the words skandalazio? in john 16 1 this this term in greek means falling away from the faith entirely from one person that used to believe so in scripture it displays that a person could believe and still go to hell from apostatizing you don't you don't see that i don't believe christians go to hell you don't believe christians go to hell but okay neither do i but if a christian professed faith in christ and then fell away does that mean, and especially in John 16, 1, the, the Greek word is skandalazio, it means that this person sinned and then they reject the faith and they fell away from entirely. So you don't grant the, the Greek word there for skandalazio? The word skandalizo, it, it just means stumbling block, an offense or whatever. And so well, you're it, assuming well, that it, it's a final stumbling as in a final apostasy. And, but what, I believe that you can apostatize in the temporal realm, but you don't apostatize from the eternal realm. How do you know that a person is secure in the eternal realm if they gave a false profession of Christ? I don't know who's saved. I know what the scriptures say. I know I'm saved because I believe the promise of scripture. Well, well, to me, it's kind of a contradiction in terms because the, the Greek word apostasia, it means defection apostasy. And this comes up in scripture a few times in the New Testament, and especially in the parable of the sower, Mark 4, 13. Is there a question there? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that. And I'm saying that they fall away 
from the faith, uh, a feast of Matei, fall away. Um, mm -hmm. Are you saying that these people were saved even though they rejected Christ just because they believed one time? Well, if we there, uh, we would have to look at the exact passage you're mentioned about the parable of the sower. I don't think it's about salvation, but a lot of people would say that the first group, first uh, seed is the one that's not saved. The rest of them are. So falling away, uh, I would take is referring to people that are saved. You can fall away in the temporal realm. You can't fall away from the eternal realm. Okay. Um. Again, another question here, because um, there's a lot of Greek words here that um, show that yeah. a person can... Yeah. I've, can I've studied them all. Go ahead. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, uh, Christian's freedom regarding eating food offered to idols, it reaches its limit when it becomes a stumbling block to one's brother. The Greek word is proskome. Paul emphasizes that he will never eat meat by causing his brother to fall, lose salvation, scandalazio. So in this verse, First Corinthians, why 89, are you believe that that's loss of salvation right there? It's just talking about not causing a brother to stumble. Okay, that's all it's saying. In First Corinthians eight nine, the Greek is pros coma, and then the Greek word is scandalazio. It literally means to cut off of salvation by eating meat to idols. This is why. Paul why are you? Why do you think it's about salvation? Where does because it say in the text about salvation? It's in the Greek. It says cut sure. off of salvation, scandalazio. In, in Where, all right, uh, what verse? What verse? In 1 Corinthians 8, 9. So scandalazio means to cut, to fall away, and scandalion. All right, so let me let me read 8, 9. There of unbelief. Let me read 8, 9. I'll read it in English first, and then I'll read it in Greek. And you tell me when you hear the word salvation. But take care of this lip. <laughs> Liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. All right. Blepite de me post ha exusia himon ati proscoma genitai tois astinesin. And I don't see the word salvation in there. You said well, the word salvation argument. was in this passage. I'm saying that you, the Greek. I clearly asked you if the word salvation was in that passage. You've uh, already I, plagiarized you one already debate. Know that. You've already plagiarized in this debate. Well, you, You're just contradicting yourself so, right here. So when you right here in this verse, First Corinthians eight nine, the Greek word is pros coma and scandalazio. It literally means to cut off of salvation. Scandalazo is not in this passage either. So you're um, making assertions about the text is not there. Thirteen. It's in verse eight thirteen. But okay, um, eight thirteen. That's fine. Therefore, this, 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 if food causes my brother to stumble, I would never eat meat again, so exactly. I would not cause my brother to stumble. It never says it's lose salvation. It's not in what? that passage either. I can read it in the Greek. It's not in there. Well, it actually does say that. It says will you that stop reading not... somebody else's commentary and confusing it, it with the scripture? All right, let's, let's try to keep it. Let's try, let's try to keep this technical, not try to do personal jabs. Let's try to keep it in the debate. Go ahead. All right. So in First Corinthians eight nine, the Greek here pros coma, and then you go to verse thirteen. It literally means scandalazio. Now there's more verses that uses this kind of language. Scandalazio, yeah. scandaleon, yeah. those that yeah, believe. Yeah. What, what does it matter if a believer is scandalous? You know, Tupac wrote a song. <laughs> she's so scandalous, but it doesn't okay. mean she's not saved. Kind of weird here. Um, I'm trying to show you're inconsistent and you're presupposing what you're saying. No, is true. What, what's the matter? I'm saying that both of those words, none of them are referring to the idea of a loss of salvation. That's something you asserted and imported in the text reading from your script. No, no, no. It, it literally reads that a stumbling block to one's brother, pros coma. Yeah. All right. What's pros your point? Pros coma is an obstacle in the way which one strikes his what's foot your point? or stumbles or falls. And yeah. later on, he says that he does not want him to lose his salvation, scandalazio. Where does it say lose salvation? You're asserting that again. The Greek, the Greek right there is scandalazio in, in verse 13. It doesn't mean up. that. It just means scandal. It just means stumbling block or offense. It doesn't mean loss of salvation. No, it means to cause to fall away. So he, what, what he's fall saying away here, from what? When you stumble, what do you do? You nine, fall down. When you stub your toe, eight nine, he doesn't. Paul doesn't want his brother eating. What? Uh, um, so Paul doesn't want idols. his brother to lose salvation. And then if he causes the re it reaches his limit 
if he causes a stumbling block to one's brother. And Paul emphasizes that he won't do it again by eating meat. If he doing so, so you believe, he causes you believe his brother that to Paul, fall and thus lose salvation. You believe that Paul believes a brother can lose his salvation by stumbling. Paul emphasizes that if, again, eating meat, he will cause his brother to fall and thus lose salvation. Scum so brothers can apostatize. Is that what you're saying? Other, he's saying that his brother is weak and, and he's destroyed by the knowledge of the strong. Is the brother 11. a Christian in this passage? Say it again. Is the brother a Christian in this passage? Well, I'm kind of asking the questions here, Charles. So I understand that, but you, you're bringing an accusation. You're making a claim and assertion. If you're going to ask me a question, you need to clarify your terms. Let's, okay, again, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, the Greek is pros coma. So let's just move on to um, another verse that uses these terms, scandalazio and pros coma, because I think you're struggling here, because it literally says that to cut off of salvation for one that believes. Paul is emphasizing that he would not do this to his brother, to a weak brother, because he will lose his salvation because he is a weak brother in Christ. The Greek word is scandalazio in John 16, 1. We see the Greek word scandalazio. Why Again, do you think a weak brother is not saved? I I didn't say that he wasn't saved. Paul is emphasizing that he can So believers cause, can stumble. He can cause his brother to stumble, proscoma, and thus lose. Well, then the debate's basically. over. No, the debate's over because you just said a Christian brother can uh, stumble, meaning apostatize. And so the statement, my affirmative is Christians can apostatize, yet they're eternally secure. And that's false. So, the Greek right here refutes you, right here. It, it didn't. It does. Because in Romans... I hope the Reformed people are watching this because they need to hold you accountable to what you're doing. You're not going to oh. listen to a free grace person, so but maybe John... Me. Maybe John Meyer and those other people will hold you accountable. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay, do you uh, if you read um in Matthew 8:13 again uh mm -hmm. it says um actually wait, Luke 8:13, sorry. The um fall away there is a feast to Mate. And uh, this this again this word means to fall away for those that once believe. A feast to Mate well yeah, I really believe that. Means to revolt, to desist, to desert, to refrain for those that used to believe. Do you deny this verse? No, I believe that verse is true, but it never says you lose your salvation. But it says a feast to Mate to remove. I don't care. You don't care. I don't care if it said Akuna Matata. <laughs> it never says loss of salvation. It just says fall away. You got to determine based on the context what you're falling away from. This is temporal in the temporal realm because they receive the word with joy, they're believers, and then they fall away. So they fell away in the temporal realm in their sanctification. Again, you're you can't refute the Greek, Charles, in in, in Mark 9 42. You again. haven't established anything with the Greek. None of the terms you're bringing up are technical terms to refer to loss of salvation. That's an assertion you made. I don't grant that assertion. Well, I'm I'm saying that a weak brother, again, Paul emphasizes in 1 Corinthians 8 9, the Greek is pros coma. If it's a weak brother, then a brother apostatized, and I won the debate. No, you lost the debate because the Greek refutes you. He's in hell. So that's what where I'm does trying it, to Where does it mention hell? Where does it say brothers go to hell Fall, because they Falling apostate. away from the faith means denying Christ, thus losing salvation. That's the context Why are you, the where, where, Where's that at? In what passage? 1 Corinthians 8, 9. The Greek is pros coma. So you're telling me, you're telling me 1 Corinthians 5 says, I mean, 1 Corinthians 8 says if we deny Christ, we lost our salvation. Wow. Okay, now you're just making things up. I'm saying when when Paul is talking food offered to idols, he's saying that it becomes a stumbling block to one's brother's salvation, pros coma. And Paul emphasizes that. But the brother Paul has salvation. Because How he's causing can a brother... his brother to fall and to lose salvation. That is scandalazio. So you keep asserting you that. You keep you asserting lost. that. I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna let you up for that. Praise He's yeah, not offering anything I, uh, else. Yeah. Let's stick to your questioning, please. Do not uh you know okay. bring anything into it with any antics or any of that stuff, please. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um 
Okay, let's let's look. Do you know what the word Greek word of means? A feastimate? Yeah. Yes. Could you please tell me what it means? It means to fall away. It means to fall away, depart, withdraw, and go away, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, a feast to mate is applied to verses that people once believed, and they a feast to mate, they withdraw and fell away, literally means cut off of salvation. You don't agree with the Greek? It doesn't say literally means cut off from salvation. It does. A feast to mate. Where? Fall away, withdraw, depart. Where? Are you, you going to show me a passage? You're going to ask look me a question. I'm making an assertion. What? Okay, so you're not going to prove your assertion when you're asking me a question. I'm asking a question of feast mate. Do you understand that if a person wants to believe and they depart, they are lost? No. What do you mean, no? This is in the Greek. You, you can't refute the Greek, Charles. You can't. You have not given me anything. I've gave, I gave you that a feast to mate means go away, withdraw, depart, fall away. Once they believe, fall they away from what? Away. Fall away from what? From the faith. They are not saved. From what? What? You can lose your faith, but you can't lose your salvation. What's yes, your point? Yes, you can. You can yes, lose you your can. salvation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it's in the Greek. You can lose your salvation only for apostates. Not so for you believe you can lose your salvation only for apostates, not true believers. So you have to assume that a passage is apostate if it threatens your Calvinistic interpretation. No, no, no. I'm saying in the Greek, we're specifically talking about apostasy, and we're specifically talking about definitions in Greek that causes apostasy. And you're not granting the Greek when it literally says they once believed and departed, fell away, apostatized, and stop believing they are not I agree saved. with all that. I agree with all that. But you're saying you're not saved. There's nothing in the definition inherent that has the idea of not saved. That's a contextual thing that you're reading in. Uh, I believe you're being inconsistent and illogical because the Greek word in John 16, 1, again, scandalazio. Well, you're, does welcome, you're welcome to make after show videos refuting me and we can go to war back and forth in those videos, which you're not going to win this one. But again, I mean, there's so many Greek words that refute your position, Charles. Especially, uh, you can you can, you can whistle every Greek word you want, but it's still not going to help you. You made an assertion about salvation. Salvation is not in the text. You can't <laughs> tell me where it is. Text, but it's in the Greek. The term Greek fall away from the freight. Scandal. You're not. I, I mean, it's in Greek. The, and the noun scandalion literally means cut off salvation, loss, seduction. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> you, you don't you don't know how to use if you're just if you're a, appealing to strongs you don't know how to use the strongs oh no i don't know but um this is well all right so since you now. said it's in strongs i want you at some point to show me where that definition is in the strongs that you, you said well you just look it up in the greek yourself oh you, it's going to say loss of salvation it's going to say enticement to unbelief cut loss of salvation Loss of salvation. It's going to say those exact words. Loss of salvation. It means to fall away, defection, and apostatize. So you will, you can see there's many. Does that mean loss one, of salvation? It's not just one Greek term. You have to use them all together in the context in a broader context. Two minutes, gentlemen. So he, again, the he, Greek he, word. Sky out, sky out's out of gas, and he's out of questions. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not even done. I haven't even gotten started yet. Well, come so, on, then. Uh, we still, we still got a whole bunch of plethora of questions for you. Um, uh, uh, we got more questions about Solomon. Wasn't he an example of a believer who totally had departed from the Solomon faith? Solomon was not a Christian. That's and, not about this Solomon debate. ever repent? That's beyond the scope of this debate. This debate's about not Christians. Really. Christians only exist since Acts 2. Not so really because... Solomon wasn't a Christian. He was a believer. But do you believe that he apostatized or repented? I believe that he's eternally secure, even though that he apostatized and probably never repented. Okay, so you believe he apostatized. Well, if you believe he apostatized, that means he's in hell. But the scriptures say, and at that's least your assertion, seven twenty four, that he repented. Do you believe that Solomon repented? Ecclesiastics, what? Seven twenty four through twenty seven. Seven twenty four through twenty seven. What so has been? Hold on, hold on. So you don't believe uh, that? 
Let me read All this so I can understand your argument. What has okay. been in remote and exceedingly mysterious? Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation, to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. That's not talking about him repenting. That's talking about that he wants to focus on evil. He wants to study it all out. And this, I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. Or one is pleasing to God to escape her, but the sinner will be captured by her. He's just saying women are bad. That it has nothing to do with salvation <laughs> or repentance. He, he, of course, we all know Solomon was with foreign women, but okay. But again, the writings from Ignatians, Polycarp, and Clement, as well as Sherbert. What's Hermes, your point? Why are you, you quoting church apost Apostasy literally means cut off of salvation. I understand that most people in the, in the church history right. have wrong views. All right, fellas. So we're at the very last part of the um, the cross-examination from Sky Out. What I'll do is I'll let you guys finalize your points in this cross-exam, and then we're going to head into the concluding statements, final statements that you guys want to say about the debate, and then go into Q&A. So go ahead and conclude this and wrap it up, please. Go ahead, go ahead Charles. I don't have nothing to say. I'll, I'll say it in my concluding statement. Oh, I thought we were both going to go. Con concluding statements? Yeah, praise. Are we doing concluding statements now? Yeah, I mean, so did Skyout, did you wrap up your point? Did, did, did you get out what you wanted to say? I'll let you finish if you need to, but if okay. not, we'll just head into concluding statements. Yeah, let's just head into concluding statements. All right. So since Charles started it out, we'll let Charles begin, and then we'll let you conclude, Skyout, the very last concluding statement. Okay. All right. So I don't need any PowerPoints, anything for this. Essentially what happened is this. Sky Out knew what, how I was preparing for this debate, and he has a right to take it in a different direction. Uh, but he made the challenge underneath my video that he made the assertion. He wrongly interpreted the participle as a verb. He made the claim that the present tense means continuous and therefore means that you will continue to believe. But my uh, a claim in this debate is a Christian can apostatize. The reason being because one moment of faith uh, is sufficient and therefore perseverance is not necessary uh, in any type of way. So that's very important because that means it's possible for a person to apostatize. Now, this is important because, you know, whenever I challenged him on the Greek, he said, I don't grant that assert. He didn't counter it. I don't know if he has the skills for that. In addition to that, he's plagiarized one debate before, and that made me suspicious. So while he started talking, I was looking for keywords, key phrases, and I found that about the scaffolding language and stuff. He didn't, And I asked him if he copied from that. So he's not a man of integrity, all right? And uh, if by his own standard, he should question whether he he is safe. Now he may say, "I well, I could I continue to believe as long as I don't live a life of sin." But yet he said that hate. If you have hate, you're not safe. Or we went through all these different categories, and any time he he would always give ground on it, you know. So that was essentially what was going on there. He made claims saying the word salvation were in text; they weren't there. He made claims that uh, about the Strongs, and you can go look those up, you know. And I'll evaluate them later on about salvation. There's nothing in Scandalizo or any of those words. Uh, falling away, uh, any of those words that refers to salvation. That is something inferred from context in his reading from those particular passages. I'm glad someone debated me, you know, on this issue because it warms me up and maybe some actual reformed person that knows their position well and that can defend it, hopefully in the languages and other things like that, will see this debate and want to take me on or or something like that. He brought up Second Peter at the end of his opening, and I already referred to the, the latter end versus the beginning is not talking about uh, how things were before you got saved as an unbeliever. It's talking about how things were going good in your sanctification after believing the gospel, but then you got entangled by false teaching, by addiction, by sin, those types of things in the context and all of that. You know, he brought up all these assertions about these words and said I didn't deal with them, but I said it was an amoeba that swallows everything up because we have that. But you know what? Since he wants to challenge me on the words, you know, 
I can I can uh, just swing right on over here to this other PowerPoint. And let me just slide this other PowerPoint over here. Yeah, so here's the words that he prides himself on. Fallen, right? Uh, pipto, uh, koimao, we saw a form of that. Parapipto, all of these words. He wants, if he wants to talk about faith and pastuo in 336, whether it's persuaded or obey, we could have done that. We could talk about the, uh, the the Hebrew behind these words and how avoiding root word fallacies. We can analyze all this. But the thing is, is that Skyout doesn't know enough Greek to engage with this. Maybe someone out there does. See, I got all these missiles and I didn't even have to use them. Why? Because the person I'm debating is not sophisticated enough, not trained enough, not developed enough to be able to interact with my arguments where they're at. So you know what I had to do? I had to go down and argue from the simple way that Wilkin did with James White. How do you know that you're saved? Persevere to the end. You haven't persevered to the end. Uh, then I had to go down the fruit route and all that. If you give me nothing to work with, I have to go that route. That's not my favorite discussion. I can have that discussion on Praise's channel at any time of the day and everything. My chart accounts for everything that we're talking about right here. Right here. Distinctives. Eternal preservation of the saints in the temporal life, the perseverance of the saints. All the concepts about perseverance go right here. Even in their confessions, it all refers to here. They're making an assumption Sky Out could become Primitive Baptist or Sovereign Grace and hold on to his precious tulip. But I would encourage him to go to Free Grace because it's more exegetical. And that's what I want you all to challenge. Hopefully you go back and you study my claims and let me know if you think I said something that was uh, not correct according to the Bible. I pray for better opponents. I'm glad for Sky Out's willingness to get out here. But uh, uh, I'm really disappointed in his performance. God bless, guys. I yield my time to be clarified. Okay, cool. Thank you, praise. Whoops, uh, I was on me. I'm, yeah. okay. oh. I'm just saying, I'd appreciate it, Charles, for your concluding statement. We'll hand it off to you now, Sky. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wanted to thank Praise and Charles. Thank you very much for your time, and thank thank you for everything. This is this is good for edifying the Lord and everyone in the in the in the chat. So, thank you for your time. But Charles, I would say you're acting inconsistently within your own worldview. Must, much of your charts and everything you said is a contradiction in terms, and you must be logically coherent and you must be logically consistent. I think Char what Charles here is doing, he wants to go into a hidden esoteric, hidden meaning, not in the plain sense of the words, not in the plain sense of the Greek. He wants to go to a hidden message and a hidden esoteric meaning in light of this free grace theology. So he's presupposing what he's saying is true without any good evidence. So, um, again, I got him in various verses, such as 1 Corinthians 8, 9, a Christian's freedom regarding eating food offered to idols. It reaches its limit when it becomes a stumbling block to one's brother, proscoma. Hence, Paul emphasizes that he will never again eat meat. If by doing so, he causes his brother to fall and lose salvation. That's in the Greek, skandalazio. Again, the term skandalazio, skandaleon, ekpipto, means they once believed and they fell away because they didn't hold on to the faith. These are apostates. So again, in Romans 16, 17, he did not address the Greek for skandaleon. He does not address the Greek for aphistomate, ones that once believed and then fell away. They are not saved. This is what it's called final apostasy. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask Praise right now if you could run a poll of, of see who won. If I lost, that's fine. If, if Charles loses, that's fine. Uh, if, if possible, if Praise can do that. And just, just to reiterate everyone in the chat, if you believe that Charles won, he is teaching that a true believer can actually reject Jesus Christ, God's only Savior, and re totally reject the gospel because he believed one time. They say that a genuine believer can stop believing in Christ, can teach against Christianity, and can even blaspheme the Christ that he once claimed to know. 
They can even deny the resurrection just because they believed one time. They admit that the possibility of a real believer abandoning Christ and totally becoming a Buddhist or Muslim or Mormon or Jehovah Witness or a Satanist. That, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but that is not biblical. Now, I don't want the people to get confused because they think that this means you can lose your salvation. The answer is no. Apostates are not people who were Christians and then stop being Christians. Apostates were never Christians, okay? So I'm not talking about the true elect people. I'm talking about a weak person in the faith or a so-called believer in the faith that has now become a Christ-rejecting unbeliever. Now, again, Charles did not explain enough. Can a true believer, a truly saved person, stop believing and revert back being an unbeliever? The question before us is whether a true justified believer may lose that justification and salvation. An unbelieving believer is a contradiction in terms. And he wants you guys in the panel in the chat to believe that the unbelieving believer is the actual real Christian that is saved. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that once we are saved, that God in his grace keeps you, 1 Peter 1, 1, 5, and that we are to hold fast to the gospel message. According to Paul, those that don't do that have believed in vain and they have a weak faith. And that's why we have to exhort one another. One minute. And we are kept by the power of God. We cannot apostatize. We cannot fall away. And those that do fall away are not from the scaffolding. They were not part of God's building house. They were just a temporary attachment, a mere scaffolding, and it's not part of the true building. I concede my time. Thank you, you guys. All right. Thank you so much, Skyote, and also Charles. And it was a lively debate. The audience had a lot to say. I think they enjoyed the, the debate as well. There will be an after show. Let me post it really quick and uh, check it out. It'll be here in a few moments. Who are you going to do a so, poll? It's already up, buddy. The poll <laughs> has been up for about 10 minutes. So, yeah, if you wanted to check that out. In fact, we could. I'll, I'll check it really quick. Who's winning here? So 46 votes. Lehman at 59% and Sky out at 41%. So Lehman right now is winning the race or the, uh, <laughs> the debate race. So I, you know, you know, I, you know, the audience might have their opinions, but you know, it's, it's good to have analysis of it as well. Looks like I got the mood around there, but uh, now we're heading to the Q and A's and super chats. We got several, we got several super chats and Q and A or questions. I think some pretty good ones as well. So we'll just get started and jump right into it. Pseudonym $2 Super Chat. Neither can disagree. Apostates are saved and strange. We got the next one. Thank you so much, William. Greetings, praise. Well, greetings to you too, William. Awesome to see you, man, in, the, in this uh, debate. And I hope you're enjoying, I hope you enjoyed it. And we got pseudonym for $10 Super Chat. For anyone with a half a brain on this topic is, can a, can a Christian apostatize and be saved? Both are OSAS and agree. Both debaters say yes. Prove me wrong. Neither really believe apostasy is a real thing. Blame Calvies. You know, this is one of those cryptic messages from Pseudo, but I appreciate it, man. If anyone knows how to decipher that, just let me know. <laughs> We yeah. still love Pseudo, though. We do, man. I appreciate oh, it, your support. I don't believe that you can apostatize from the eternal realm. The eternal realm. Yeah. He believes that he uh, that you can't apostatize from the eternal realm or the temporal realm. So pseudonym saying, well, you both believe that you can't apostatize. Echoing praise. Echoing praise. Your mic's cutting out, praise. I'm just it's gonna have to be like that for a couple of moments here since I can't turn it off. But you're good, you're good. Um you're good. yeah, so you know, is that true? Do you think you can apostatize temporally or fall away, sky out? And, and would you consider that a pot maybe maybe this needed to be hashed out better? What how, what do you consider apostasy? Do you think it's a temporal thing or an eternal thing? 
Well, just like what Charles said, he believes uh, nothing you can do to separate in the internal realm. But uh, I believe that God protects you in the temporal realm as well in faith, and he keeps you also in the internal realm. Like, why would it be separate? Like, why would he keep you in the internal realm and not in the temporal realm? That doesn't make any sense to me. And for a person to say that you're eternally secure in the eternal realm and then become an apostate and hate the God that gives them eternal salvation, I do not believe they're a Christian or saved. Apostates are simply not saved. False converts are not saved. Reprobates are not saved. Even if they believe one time, there's no places in Scripture that teaches that a person can uh, reject Christ and, and still have salvation. There's nothing in Scripture that demonstrates that. And Charles could not demonstrate. He might have pulled out some Greek words and some some pretty good arguments, but he couldn't. He couldn't Is this your second Scripture. closing statement? <laughs> No, I'm just answering. Yeah, try to make these okay. Yeah. okay, go ahead, Charles. We're going to respond to that. Uh, question for Charles: Can a believer love and hate God at the same time? No, not at the same time. You, you, you can, uh, but the passage about loving God and money is talking about serving God, and you can, and all that saying is you can't serve God equally. So, in other words, if if you're you're pulled, you know, your affections are divided, your loyalty is divided. It doesn't mean you're. It, it's not talking about you're not saved. It's just saying, look, you can't be fully devoted to one over another. Thank you so much, Charles. And, and go ahead, Scott, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, again, there, there's many passages in Scripture that speak of Christians, um, basically backsliding. And they talk about many places in scripture where you could uh, go in that direction of apostasy. But a true saving faith will always persevere and endure in the end. And God will bring you back into the faith. And for those that fall away completely and apostatize, I personally believe they had a false confession of faith and they never truly believed. In 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were never of us. All right. And since it was addressed to you, Charles, you can make your final statement or whatever you want to say there. Go ahead. Uh, just move on. Yeah, there's nothing else to say about that. Okay. Question for you, Sky Out. Whose work are you reading from and trying to convince us that you're not plagiarizing? <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I just took a, a bunch of crap and just shove it all together. No, I mean, um, I did a little bit of research and uh, I put some things together. Um, I think Charles also used some sources. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to use sources um, and, and then to. to I cited my sources defense. and I asked you about your if you used any sources and I mentioned a particular source and you denied using it. I did. You have I, no, I did you, have no you have no integrity. Use. You have no one. No, I did not use I do. I don't I don't didn't use a source that you mentioned. The problem is you don't have an absolute standard or an objective standard or a foundation for truth to even make it's it, is cro is, cro is is cross dressing apostasy. Uh, is 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 being bald apostasy? Is being bald a sin? Uh, is being George Costanza a sin? No, not if you like Seinfeld. <laughs> That was fun. Just a little friendly, friendly banter there. Okay, praise. Cuckoo, praise, praise. praise, praise. I'm mute again. Yeah, so that was a good one. I appreciate appreciate the banter there, back and forth. We'll go to the next question. So, Sky up for it's a uh, for redeem says, how many times can I be saved? Well, that's kind of a inconsistent question. Obviously, one time, but. It, if a person confesses Christ one time, one moment in time, I believe they're saved unless they give a false profession of faith and they didn't mean it from the heart. I don't believe that person is saved just because they have a mental acknowledgement who Christ is. Gotcha. And Charles, you didn't respond to that? Yeah, one moment is sufficient to, to and you're saved one time as far as positionally saved. Now, in your walk, you're saved constantly. Moment by moment. All right. All right. We'll go to the next question. Killer Banana. Did Jesus die for the sin of apostasy? And it's not addressed to anyone. So we'll start with Charles since he was the affirmative. 
Yes, Jesus died for all sin, and nobody goes to hell for sin, not even the sin of apostasy. Guy out? Uh, I would respond that um, God can forgive apostasy if they were to turn back to God and ask for repentance. I know in Hebrews 6 it says that's impossible, but I believe God can forgive all sins, including apostasy, only if they come back to the faith. So it's just to clarify, you're saying he did die for the sin of apostasy, but there's a condition attached to it? Is that what you're saying? I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I, I would say that Jesus died for all sins. I agree. Apostatizing, I believe that only to the extent of not final apostasy. I don't believe Christ died for reprobates, apostasy, or false converts. But I do believe a Christian can head in that direction. If he doesn't return, then that means I don't believe he's saved. But if he does return he didn't reach final apostasy and then he's back in the grace of God. This is similar to what in, in John where he says that the, you have to stay in the vine of Christ and those that do not stay in the vine of Christ wither and die. And that's relating to apostates. They are not saved. And the Greek word for other verses in first Corinthians six, eight, scandalazio, proskuma, all implied that a person with a weak faith can apostatize and lose salvation. If they're not ex exhortations, they don't have exhorts. All right, thank you so much, Doki, for that cherry pie. I feel like some right now. It's been good. It's been good to be enjoyed it. Pseudonym two dollars question for both: Is apostasy a real thing or not? Yes, it's more real than you are. <laughs> that was funny. Um, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, apostasy is a real thing. Certainly, in Scripture, it does speak of uh, apostasy. Acts twenty one twenty one. Um, but yeah, I think for a true saving faith in Christ and a true believer, apostasy um is not a requirement to to even debate about because I believe scriptures teach that real Christians can't fall away. We are elect. And that since I'm a Calvinist, there's no way I can take that position that apostates are saved and God's elect can be unregenerate. An unregenerate person cannot yeah. be saved. Yeah, your Calvinism will not allow you to think beyond what you see uh, what what from your creeds. Oh, I can say your free grace doesn't allow you to see that apostates are not saved. So I can say no, that, oh, but, right, we'll, we'll cut it off there. We'll just cut it right there. So question from Killer Banana to, I'm not sure who this is addressed to, but if if all believers abide, why does First John command and not feel shame? Do not feel shame. Well, all believers don't abide. And uh, the thing is, is that there is going to be a temporary shame at the judgment seat of Christ. That's in 1 John chapter 2, I think it is. My response Appreciate would be that. The, the, the verse talking about is actually in John 15. The one must abide in Christ to be fruitful. Now, the question really is about can we assume that all believers will abide? I mean, I mean, can a true believer be unfruitful? So I believe that abiding is essential for bearing fruit. So, and I believe in John 15, 4, that a branch cannot bear fruit except by abiding in the vine. And Charles, you have something to finish out to say there. Go ahead. We'll just go to the next question. Yeah, maybe maybe we should do another debate on John 15, since that seems to be the passage that's driving your interpretation of a lot of these issues. Certainly. Hey, wait. Before Bubblegum, there was a question. Yeah, unless uh, I hit the wrong button. I, yeah, so this is from Jared, $5 Super Chat. Question for Charles. If one believes or has faith, fire can burn them, yet will willfully puts his hand in the fire. Does he really believe fire can burn him? Yeah, maybe he just likes the fire. What's your point? <laughs> maybe he's a sadomasochist. He's a sadomasochist, huh? And Scott, did you want to respond to that? Go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, he just kind of threw me off with saying that. Um, or as a fire can burn and will be put his hand of. Um, I see. I think he means this in a metaphorical sense or a hyperbolic language. 
if a person believes can fire burn them in a sense where he can be tempted and fall away can that fire of satan bring salvation out of that person i, I would say that metaphorically hyperbolic speaking if that person does not give their heart to christ fully and fully trust him that you are secure in christ and cannot fall away that yes the fire of satan can willfully put their hands on you and remove your salvation just like in the parable of the sower i think that uh he's been hanging out with pseudonym too much too much and we'll go to the next one from bubblegum using first john 315 thank you so much bubblegum but also jared as well where does salvation deliver you to Do you want to take that one? I'll take that one. I would say First John three fifteen. Uh, where does salvation deliver you to? I would say salvation delivers you to um, the millennial reign of Christ. It brings you to faith in Christ. It brings you to the end of faith, where if Jesus were to return, or if I die, I'm resurrected. So, or if I die, I'll be in heaven. So, I believe that the end times, eschatologically uh, speaking, that it would deliver us to the second coming second advent of christ okay well he didn't address the verse first john three fifteen. so i'll read it everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him yeah that just means that you're not experiencing eternal life abiding in you whenever you're in hate in other words abiding is a fellowship term so that's all it's saying is you're not experiencing that abundant life when you're in hate when you're being a hater Appreciate that, Charles. Eagle, the next question from Pseudo, $10. Thank you so much, my man, for your support. To clarify, Charles defends Satanists and Jeffrey Dahmers. Is Sky Out holding the same? If if the true believer described previously fit once they what's an apostate? What's an apostate if they believed at one point? It's kind of a crazy sentence there. Um, well, I certainly don't defend a Satanist. As far as Jeffrey Dominers, he, at the end of his life, he did say he was sick and he repented. He believed in the Trinity. If you watch the Je Jeffrey Dahmer special on Netflix, you can see that he was a very sick person, ate people's brains and stuff. And he did believe one time at the end of his life, and then he got killed by a cellmate. I believe that he was saved because he confessed Christ at the end one time. Yeah. So what if the reason that he got killed by a cellmate because he was trying to eat him? Was he saved then? Yes, uh, trying to eat them. Uh, so you can you can eat people, and you're still saved as long as you don't give up your faith. You can eat people. I, well, I, well, he was sick. He admitted that he was a sinner, and he was sick in the head. He was. He was I understand that, but is it, so you could be saved but sick in the head. That's what you're saying. Certainly, he he confessed that okay. he couldn't. So why his... can't you be sick in the head and worship Satan as a believer? Because it's a contradiction in terms. It might be a contradiction, but someone that's sick in the head ain't thinking right anyway. Yeah, but he rejects. They're insane Christ. in the membrane. Yeah, but at least Jeffrey Dahmer believed in the end. If you want to take someone like another, like uh, Charles Manson, he never repented. So, like Charles Manson, uh, you know, if he he doesn't believe, so that he wouldn't fit in even that category. So you think <laughs> repentance is necessary for salvation? No, I never said that. I said it's a prerequisite to faith. Okay, is it a gift or is it a result? It's a gift. Okay, so if so, wouldn't you automatically repent if it's a gift like faith? You think that you persevere in faith? How come you don't persevere in repentance? I believe I do. So you believe that it isn't just about what you believe, that you also got to live a, a holy lifestyle to the end of your life, not just your faith. Um, a holy lifestyle? No, I don't think I would say holding lifestyle to faith in a sense that not abandoning Christ. And can you can you I mean, believe the gospel, but be you? Uh, can you believe the gospel, but be you Hefner? Say it again. Can you believe the gospel, but be Hugh Hefner? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All okay. right, and that'll be. We'll, we'll go to the next question. I appreciate that. that was a good. That was a good discussion. So Ashley says, uh, "Question: I am forty-five. How many times did Israel apostatize? 
How many times did Jesus say, forgive our brothers? Does Question God for a sky his... out. <laughs> That's up high in 45. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even see that. Okay, yeah, for sky out. So, does God forgive Israel after they repent from their apostasy? Yes, of course. I believe that God can forgive apostasy as long as they come back to him, just like what the Israels did. But I think if those people stay in that stasis of apostasy, they reject God and they're under his judgment and they will face that judgment at death for the reputation of God and Yahweh and Jehovah. So the one true God, do six, four, one God, all Israel. So like, uh, I do believe that they were saved because they didn't reach final apostasy. Gotcha. We'll go to the next question now. So you need a song instead of the instead of the final countdown. This is the final fall down. <laughs> we got a question from Good Shorts. Question for Sky Out in John five twenty four. What does shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life mean? I I'll, that's a great verse actually. I would say those that believe don't face condemnation, but they pass death unto life in a sense that the death of dying to unbelief unto faith in Christ into life, or it could be referring to physical death instead of spiritual death. It's you're not facing condemnation. You've passed death unto life because of what Christ did on the cross and his death, burial and resurrection. So the gospel saves. So I think from death unto life means that a true believer has passed from death unto life in his saving grace. And uh, Charles, you have something to say? Do they yeah, add to that? well, I, I brought it up in my debate because, you know, it, it talks about the results of salvation. But the assumption is, is that he says a believer, a believer that's passed from death to life can't apostatize in the temporal realm. I say they can. Okay, praise. Cuckoo, praise. I'm so it's on mute again. This stupid mute button. It's, I'm just going to, even if it's echoing, I'm just going to keep it going. So appreciate that, Charles. You got a question for you, man. If one believes or has faith, fire will burn them. If He's they trying touch to it, reward his question. Yeah. yeah. Then they willfully touch the fire. Do they really believe fire burns them? Yeah, they do. They just like they the fire. Just like like I said, sadomasochism. <laughs> so, do you there, want to respond to that, Scott? Or oh no, I'm okay. You... Okay, we'll move to the next question here. Moving through these nice and swiftly. That's wonderful. Where did my thing go? Here we go. Question for both: Have you guys ever traveled to Greece? Have any friends who speak Greek or any part of the local Greek culture groups? Thanks. And that's, uh, I don't uh, know who that's from. Yeah, for both. I, I don't know who it was well, from. Though. When I, I was in that. college, um, real quick, real quick, Charles. When I was in college, I used to know people that traveled to Greece and then a whole bunch of people, my professors and students that spoke Greek. But I, I personally, I never been to Greece. Go ahead. So this is probably from a Steven Anderson night influence person because this is the arguments that they typically try to do to undermine uh, the Greek argumentation of, of scholarship. Now, first off, reading the Bible for exegesis is not the same thing as speaking in that. Second of all, I have through Jordan Day, who's now an apostate, by the way, maybe he's coming back to God. On Discord, we used to have a, a reading group in there. Uh, some of them were doing a little bit of conversive stuff. You know, eventually I would do that, you know, but it's the same reason I didn't learn Arabic or whatever. I don't believe the Bible is inspired in Arabic. And I don't believe that me speaking to the Greek uh, culture is necessary for me to understand the Bible. It, it, it could be helpful, but it's not it, it's not necessary. And maybe eventually I'll do that. And by the way, if that person wants to study with me, come to Discord and let's see what they got. Very cool. Very cool. I, that'd be awesome. So we'll head to the next last question of the debate, and then we'll probably shut her down in last statement, or this is our last little remarks you guys want to say. But here we go. Stephanie, for both, 
Have you guys ever traveled to? Oh, that that was the one. It was from Stephanie. Okay, I'm glad we. I just copied it twice. So there, that that concludes the Q and A's. That was awesome, fellas. And uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to see some reviews of this. I'd just see different opinions, and I, and hopefully it's sophisticated. I, I mean, I'm not not just like you know run your mouth and just because you don't like the person, actually give some type of educated response or rebuttal to their remarks or whatever I just yeah to and, that anyway. but they, yeah because whoever's going to review this video may be my next debate opponent so choose your words wisely would you like to formally debate charles email me and we will set it up and charles will debate you anyone out there any calvinist any arminian catholic we all will allow anyone charles loves debating but also Skyout, he does debates too. He doesn't back down. So I appreciate both for stepping in the arena tonight. Thank I enjoy you. moderating it. Yeah. Good job, guys. But we will have an after show now. And uh, is there anything little, when I mean last remarks, I don't mean 10 to 15 minute comments and statements that, you know, just. No, I, <laughs> just I'm thankful that Skyout was willing to do this. In the words of Brother Martin, I think his sanctification is low, and he needs to work on his integrity. But thank you, Sky. Right. Thank you, Sky. Yep, yep. And I just wanted to thank Praise and thank Charles for your time. I would also say that Charles is also making inconsistent statements and presupposing in certain texts without any consistency. And your clothing is over with. Being illogical and inconsistent. Good. Yeah, that concludes your final remarks. And I have the results of the poll. So 60% said Charles when we had 56 uh, votes and 39% sky out. So Charles, according to the audience, won the debate. So there you go, sky out. That's the winner. But if you disagree, you can maybe do an after show or, you know, response to that. But um, that will end it, guy. Everyone in the chat, appreciate all the support and uh, contribution. God bless. We will see you soon.